Okay, so there we are. Um, yes, and also, you know, this is the first of these types of sessions that we've done between um, the alumni team and the career service. So your feedback is very much appreciated. If you have any thoughts or comments about the session today, then please do record them in the shared notes function that you'll see on the left side of the screen. Um, and that's completely anonymous. So any comments you want to make or constructive feedback you can give us, you can add to the, the shared notes there. So to properly introduce um, your team today, <laughs> there is um, Jen Foreman, who you can see there just now. She's our, um, the university's alumni relations manager. Myself, Lauren Ferguson, I'm one of the careers and employability consultants with the careers and employability service and it's my responsibility to be chairing the event today. And Fiona's just appeared there as well. So we've got Fiona <laughs> McMillan, who's our alumni and business engagement officer. So the three of us are here really just to kind of help facilitate the session. Um, Fiona and Jen will be helping me in terms of, you know, looking out for um, questions in the chat box. So, yeah, just to, to help you to engage with the session. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jen for the next slide here because this is a little bit about um, alumni isn't it there we go Jen yes. over to you. perfect thanks Lauren um I thought it'd be a good idea to introduce myself and Fiona we're part of the um, alumni relations team at the university um, I've been working at the university for uh, quite a long time several years um, and I've seen the alumni database grow um, quite a lot over the over the years I've been here. Um, we've got almost 92,000 former students we're, we're in touch with, and that covers um, about 120 countries. So it's great to see you all today. If you're a graduate, that's great. If you're still a student, that's still great as well. Um, and we're here to help you. Um, Fiona is our alumni and business engagement officer, and she's working on a project to recruit graduate apprenticeships. She can also explain to you about our um, online mentoring platform as well. Uh, as Lauren said, this is the first of our alumni webinars. We can't do physical events just now. Um, and we came up with an idea to try and help the class of 2020. And who better to join us than graduates from the class of 2008 and 9, who also graduated in challenging times. And you'll hear from them later. This is the first of our webinars. Um, we're hoping to do ones that are, could be sector specific, perhaps alumni working in sport or nursing or research, for instance. I know Fiona wants to do ones um, with alumni working in gaming. So if you've got any other ideas, please just let us know. We're really active across social media, so please follow us or join the groups. And there'll be links at the end of the presentation as well. And keep in touch with us via our alumni at stir.ac.uk email address. We'd love to hear what you're doing. Looking at events, well, we, um, we'd we love to do physical events. We, we can't do that just now. We have had some great events and reunions over the years. We've had Tartan Day Parade in New York. We've had reunions in Beijing and Shanghai and anniversary events on campus and in Edinburgh and London. So hopefully we'll get to see you at a physical event soon. We also do um, an annual publication, it's called Sterling Minds, and if you've opted in to receive that, that would be great. And we do three e-newsletters throughout the year as well. In terms of benefits, we offer a Find a Friend service. If you've lost touch with someone um, and you would like to contact them again, just come through us and we can act as a go-between and uh, put you in touch with them again. There are also various discounts if you want to join the gym or the library or if you want to stay in campus accommodation. We run an alumni ambassador programme and at the moment we've got around 700 graduates who give back to the university in terms of mentoring students, um, they provide case studies or testimonials, they've been guest speakers like our panel today or they've organised events in their local area. And if any of that sounds interesting to you, just let me know. The alumni that we have, they're so supportive and generous and they really want to help you. If you're looking for a mentor, then you can join the Sterling Network um, and Fiona can explain a bit more about that as well. Maybe in a few years time, you want to talk to us about your career and you want to, to volunteer as well, and that would be great. It's not always about money um, and it'd be, be great if you could get involved in our community as well. Uh, keep in touch and as always, uh, Bleed Green. 
is our hashtag there. Um, on to Fiona now, and she can explain a little bit about the Sterling Network. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to see you all today. Um, as a Sterling graduate myself or a Sterling alumna myself, it's a pleasure to speak with you and a pleasure to work in alumni relations at Sterling. We do have a very lovely alumni family, which you're all part of. Um, just to talk about the Sterling Network really briefly. Um, the Sterling Network is our free platform bringing together our student, alumni and business community for mutual benefit. So this consists of mentoring, networking, recruitment opportunities. There's, there's loads of different ways that you can get involved there. Um, we've got the link on the screen so you can get involved at thesterlingnetwork.com. And I very much hope to see you there. Um, I'll pass back to, to Lauren now just to continue today. We get kicked off. But thank you to our panellists and thank you to you all for joining. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so just a little bit more about the, the format for the session today then. So as I mentioned, there will obviously be an opportunity for you all to ask questions of our um, panellists. So our panel for today, we've got their, their names and their subjects that they graduated from in the, the slide there for you. So you can see who everybody is. And also when each um, panelist is speaking, uh, we've got an individual slide with more information about them. So you can um, sort of identify everybody and um, just keep a record of anybody you want to ask questions to at the end. So what we'll do is each person will speak for about just a few minutes, just three, four minutes, just to give you a bit of background about who they are, what their experience was um, around the time that they graduated. Um, just to hopefully, you know, give you the benefit of that experience, really, because, you know, there's a lot of negativity out there at the moment when it comes to graduating in the graduate labour market. So just to think about some positive steps that you all can take. So hopefully it'll be a really useful um, session for you, really informal, really friendly. Um, so please do, you know, um, ask your questions for the panel. So we'll, we're going in alphabetical order. So we are starting with Alexandra in just a moment. Um, once everybody has a chance to speak, you can post questions to the chat as we go along. But once everybody's had a chance to speak, we'll kind of open it up for questions. And then Jen and Fiona and myself can help direct questions to each of the panel members. Um, so hopefully that kind of explains the, the format that we're going for. So what we'll do now is I'll move on to our first panelist slide and introduce you to Alexandra Webb. So Alexandra, please, could you turn your camera on for us, your webcam on? And what I'll do is I'll turn mine off <laughs> for now. And I will also put myself on mute just to give um, Alexandra the, the chance to take the floor for a moment. OK, I think that uh, the camera is warming up, so welcome everyone, and it's a real pleasure to be part of this event, um, and it's a great pleasure for me to share my experience as an alumni of the university as well. So uh, my name is Alexandra Webb, and initially I uh, graduated in Arts and Humanities. I have a master's degree in Aesthetics and Philosophy, so uh, different subject than listed here from University um, of Warsaw in Poland. And so in very short, my background, I have artistic background, I was a child performer, and my dream was always to work in, in arts. Um, however, after my graduation, uh, I moved to Scotland for personal reasons. And um, uh, if you've ever moved to another country, and, and many of you have had, you will recognize that this is a, a challenging experience um, in itself. Um, so uh, from then I had to shape up my um, uh, uh, career and my working life. And initially um, I started working as an interpreter and uh, in the hospitality sector, figuring out um, in what to do with myself really. Um, and, and I guess this is why I thought that a, a next challenge in, term of, in terms of development would have been um, a, a great um, after immersing myself in a Scottish culture. And probably not even a year after my uh, arrival to Scotland, I enrolled for a master course and did my conversion course in management here uh, and at Sterling. 
So I am a proud graduate of this institution. Um, and I guess I had big dreams like uh, all of the graduates. I thought that maybe I will be going to uh, work and, and search graduate jobs, big jobs, as many of you will um, uh, have, have hoped to do that too. But then the financial crisis 2008 happened um, just as I graduated. And I had to very quickly rethink my plans. And instead of going to for big schemes, I ended up working locally instead um, in events and uh, um, in events department of a leisure booking company initially, which I would say that wasn't my probably initial choice, not what I would have had uh, in mind, but I kind of stuck with it. And one day, perhaps a year or so later, um, unexpectedly quite, um, I got an email from my program director uh, encouraging me to apply for PhD uh, scholarships. So uh, I jumped to the occasion and in 2008, I started um, doing my PhD in in cultural management. So this opportunity allowed me to sort of go back and combine my passion for arts and, and social good with the, the management knowledge that I gained uh, when I was studying uh, at uh, Stirling University. And uh, I guess um, uh, the journey finished up, me being here now. So I'm speaking to you now as an employee of, of uh, Stirling University and I am a, a, a lecturer uh, here. I predominantly teach and do research. Um, probably I would have never expected that the journey will take me here. Um, I guess as a small girl, I used to actually talk extensively and instruct my toys. So perhaps there was a, a grain or a seed for me being lecturer, uh, but I just needed a time um, to arrive to that thoughts. But I guess experience uh, have led me to this uh, place. So I can safely say that um, I have realized my dreams, even though the pathway or journey was not uh, quite straightforward and perhaps not what I have planned initially for. Um, so if I would um, want to share with you just um, a, a something, a piece of advice um, would be that um, being a um, student of Stirling University, I'm sure that you have taken advantage of some amazing um, career development workshops. And very often uh, you will have had the uh, presentation of tools of how to maybe strategically manage your uh, your career and steps to um, uh, shaping of your career. But my advice, especially in these times that are quite challenging and definitely unprecedented, uh, is to also be very opportunistic. Um, as I did, I was just open to opportunities that came my way. And for sure, the impact of COVID will be felt. You might be at the moment stressing out and worrying what the future looks like for you. But um, different opportunities will, the opportunities will definitely come your way. Your first job might not be the, the, the job that you dreamt about or even that you have considered. But remember that careers develop um, over time. No one actually becomes an expert very quickly or, or in one day. So try different things. Uh, try and utilize opportunities that will come your way and try to learn as much as you can from any opportunities given. Um, I think that's the key um, to having that mindset and learning growth mindset that will ensure uh, that you will slowly but surely shape um, your career in the way you want. Every circumstances and every context has an opportunity for you to learn. And I encourage you to be positive and have your eyes really widely open to any opportunity that comes your way. That's great. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Some really good insights there. OK, so if there's any questions for Alexandra, we'll keep them for the end after everybody has spoken. So, um, Alexandra, you can stop sharing your webcam now and I'll invite Ali to share his webcam. And come on oh, the screen for us. Okay. Let me just move the slide on so we've got the right slide for you, Ali. Sure. There we uh, are. I'll hand that, over to you. <laughs> is that sounding OK? Can you hear me OK there? Sounds good. Yeah, we can Excellent. hear you. Excellent. That's good. OK, that's good. Seeing as I work in radio and audio, I would hope you would be able to hear me OK. Um, yeah, first of all, um, I couldn't agree any more with what Alexandra was saying there about positivity and sort of taking chances. And, 
you know, it's kind of okay to not know where you're going ultimately. Uh, that was that was super inspiring. Um, and congratulations to everyone who's graduated as well. Um, I can't quite believe that it's been 11 years since I graduated. Um, yeah, of course, went to Sterling, graduated in 2009, doing film and media along with a lot of other people. Um, my time at Sterling Uni was amazing. I loved it. I got involved in so many different things and predominantly the student radio. Air 3, which I'm still glad to see is going strong and, and, and really well. Um, and it was actually there that really did help launch my career working with the BBC and working in the music industry. Um, it's really nice to be asked to come and do this today. Um, I think I've had a very, very varied career and one that has definitely not followed the traditional path and still doesn't. I currently am a producer uh, for the BBC working for BBC Sounds, which is the BBC's um, sort of combined audio app to compete with Spotify and Apple Music. Um, and I'm based at the Glasgow office, but I spent um, five or six years living in London, managing my own music company, uh, working in PR and music management, where I managed the career of several artists sort of who were touring internationally and releasing on major record labels. Um, before that, I was lucky enough in my first job actually professionally in media was being a Radio 1 presenter, which is still to this day feels like a ridiculous thing to be saying. That was that was a dream job that I think was so far off in my mind when I was at university that I wasn't even aiming for it. Um, and the way I ended up getting there was actually because of the student radio station that I was involved with and being lucky enough to come to Stirling and, and be part of the amazing atmosphere and uh, sort of creative buzz of the media studies course. Um, I, when I was at the university, uh, invited lots of professionals to come and speak for the university radio station and speak at events for the different people. And it was connections there that I made with people at the BBC that a couple of years after I graduated, I was working in Glasgow, uh, working full time in a restaurant, which I'd done since since university. Shout out to the filling station in Stirling. Um, I think it's still there. Uh, I worked there for a long time during uni and then moved to Glasgow and worked there full time. Where I did quite a lot of startup work, where I launched a kind of YouTube channel way before anyone had set up like this and it was kind of normal we're talking a decade ago um promoting bands and making videos with lots of other friends i had who had graduated from sterling who were amazing camera operators or graphic designers or audio engineers and we all kind of chipped together and started this project called detour which was putting on live events with gigs and i presented that and kind of produced the whole thing and it was because i'd done that that a connection i'd made while at sterling uni came to me from the bbc and said hey we'd like to try you out to potentially present a radio show. Um, and unbeknownst to me, I, I, I must have succeeded at that. And I, and I ended up replacing a guy who I'd looked up to called Vic Galloway, who was the sort of new music guy in Scotland for Radio 1 at the time. And then very quickly, I think it was a year and a half after graduating, I, had, um, I became a radio presenter, which was amazing. I did a really glamorous time slot on Radio 1 of midnight till two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday on a Sunday, which is literally the lowest slot on the on the bill. But it was an amazing start. And I spent four years um, doing that and DJing and being freelance and working on all manner of strange projects and comparing festivals and working for various brands and kind of splitting my time between Glasgow and London, uh, but still quite proudly living in Glasgow most of the time. Um, and being able to do that from there. And during that time, I, I was working with a lot of bands and I got to know a lot of bands and I ended up managing one of them. And I definitely would never have considered myself a music manager. I think my my words were, I'll help you out until we find you an actual manager. But things went incredibly well with that band. They were signed to a major record label. Um, they were called Prides. They <laughs> ended up doing everything from playing Glastonbury, which was an amazing memory, to tour in America multiple times. Um, and I ran their business and 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 kind of that kept me afloat for quite a few years as well. Um, then the show ended on Radio 1 and I moved to London and I started music management and doing PR work within the music industry, um, which a long story short, um, led to some more fantastic experiences. And then in 2017, I was approached by the same producer who had come and spoken at 
Stirling University when I was when I was with the student radio station. The same producer who had got me my first start, start at the BBC, he came to me after a number of years of not working together and said, look, there's a project in Scotland that I think you'd be really good for. Um, and I applied for it and I, I was granted the role of becoming a producer in development, which is what I've been doing for the last three years. Um, and I think it's important to point out that I don't have a full time job. I still currently work six month to six month contracts, which is really common now. Um, for me, a six month contract is huge. That's that's a really long contract in my industry. Um, so, you know, as much as I, I've had an amazing career, I've been really lucky. It's not that I have sort of stability forever. I don't think a job forever exists anymore at all. And I'm quite glad of that because I love moving about and doing different things. And especially in media and music, you need to evolve and, and take chances. But the reason for that whole big long spiel there was because the thing that's really saw me through is not necessarily having a job or having certain things in my CV, but it's having really good relationships with people that I've met along the way. Um, I wouldn't have started managing bands if I hadn't been working in radio and kind of having a knowledge there. I wouldn't have been working in radio had I not volunteered for the student radio station and been doing the media studies course. And I wouldn't have been considered for that had I not started up my own project on YouTube, um, working with my friends who all ended up working in the industry as well. One of them is a newsreader on BBC News now, um, which is amazing. Uh, one of them works in graphic design for the BBC. Another one uh, manages quite a large promotions company putting on concerts in Glasgow. So I've definitely come from quite a startup mentality and I still have to employ that as I still in my spare time manage an artist who I get to meet about twice a year because he lives in Nashville. But I manage his business and he makes his living off music. He does really well from it. Um, and that means I kind of work full time by day for the BBC and then at night switch into music mode and spend a couple hours doing that, including last night when I was up till three in the morning editing videos, little social media videos to release tomorrow. So um, I do a lot of different things. Um, and that's only scratched the surface of it. But the kind of key theme has been connections I've made and keeping in touch with people. And that's always opened up opportunities for me. And that's something that when I was graduating, I looked at as this terrifying thing. But I didn't realise that at that time, the people I was surrounded with were actually the ones that would become my contacts. And that horrible word of networking was just natural. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, Ali. You can no see that I was nodding along with a lot of what you were saying there. Um, the same with Alexandra as well. Thanks so much for that insight. OK, so if you're OK to turn your webcam off now, I will invite our next speaker, who is Carolyn, um, to turn your webcam on, Carolyn, and say hello to us all. Hi, everyone. Hope you can hear me OK. Um, yes, we can, yes. I'll mute myself now. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me to uh, speak today. It's been uh, really interesting as well hearing from Alexandra and Ali on their experiences, a lot of which I think I can relate to as well. Um, so I'm Carolyn, so I currently work for Skyscanner um, as a global brand lead, which is great for me because I absolutely love traveling um, and I'm eagerly awaiting the, the government announcements at the moment on when we can book flights again. So uh, selfishly for myself, but obviously for, for the company as well. Um, so just a bit about suppose, my um, career today and experience. Um, so I graduated in 2009 um, after completing a degree in marketing and media. Um, now I remember being in my fourth year and was getting a bit concerned because I still didn't really know what I wanted to do at that stage. Um, a lot of my friends, I remember, were really clear on the, their ideal jobs and their career paths and the roles they wanted to apply for. Um, but I really didn't know. I kind of knew that I wanted to stay within marketing and I was really interested still in media, but I didn't actually know what that meant for me or what to, to do to kind of work it out. Um, so in the end, I started to apply for graduate schemes because um, from researching them, I understood that if you got on a graduate scheme, you could get um, exposure to different areas of a business and um, you'd get placed in different roles um, and it could really help inform you of what you're actually interested in and what you wanted to do. Um, so it was quite a competitive time, I think, in 2009. So I just started off applying for all the graduate schemes that I could. Um, I wasn't necessarily picky about what they were. 
that um, if I like the sound of the, the company, I just went for it. Um, and I was lucky enough in the end to be offered a place on Royal Mail's graduate scheme. Um, but I actually meant moving from um, Edinburgh to London, which I hadn't really factored in. Um, so that was a bit scary, kind of moving down there on my own, not knowing everybody. Um, but I thoroughly enjoyed the graduate scheme. Um, I got put on to a couple of different placements uh, before moving off the graduate scheme and getting a, a permanent role with them. But the graduate scheme just gave me so much support. Um, they really worked with me to understand kind of what areas I wanted to get experience in. Um, they really kind of drilled it into you, encouraged you to network as much as possible, um, which has kind of paid off um, in terms of my career as well. Um, but when I was at Royal Mail, it was just under three years. And in that time, I actually went through three restructures, um, which was quite kind of daunting. And obviously, I'd never kind have experienced anything like that before um, and the company was changing so much as well so after the third time I thought I think it's my time to go now um, and I took voluntary redundancy um, but I actually managed to get a, another role um, very quickly uh, working for ITV and it was actually through a, a contact that I'd worked with at Royal Mail um, that I got that job so I see it kind of really paid off to build the, the relationships um, and kind of widen my network so um, I worked for ITV um, in a digital marketing role um, for about four years and I absolutely loved it because uh, um, I was kind of so passionate about TV and obviously it kind of played into my, my degree media but also marketing um, and I think I could have happily stayed there to be honest kind of forever I, I loved it um, but after four years I decided that the role itself I just didn't feel it was challenging me as much anymore like I felt it became easy and I probably wasn't learning as much um, and I was quite ambitious I wanted to obviously progress in my career so um, even though I loved what I was doing I decided to kind of take the, the leap into the unknown and, and leave um, and got a role and um, moved over to the drinks industry and worked for tenants and um, so I moved back up to Glasgow for about a year and a half and then back down to London uh, for Diageo still in the kind of digital marketing space um, although kind of throughout that time I started to realise that although I did enjoy doing digital marketing I actually wanted to kind of broaden my experience and get more brand experience and experience of above the line marketing so I started to kind of ask to be um, put on to other projects or work maybe with other teams that I wouldn't necessarily work with just to try and um, broaden my experience, um, which paid off because the job I've got now working for Skyscanner sits within brand too. So I think that I've not kind of have put myself out there and taken on maybe other roles. I probably wouldn't have got the, the role that I've got now and probably kind of career wise, it's the, the, the happiest I've been with the company I work for um, and the role that I've got as well. Um, but I think looking back, it's probably I've always focused more on the, the role and the job rather than the industry. And that's why I've kind of jumped around a bit from drinks to um, kind of say Royal Mail and postage to, to travel where I am now. But it's been the jobs that I've really focused on and, and the experience that I'll get from those particular uh, roles. Um, but I think, as I think Ali mentioned as well, it's always it's also about kind of who you work with. And I think I've learned it's not always you're not guaranteed to like everybody you work with but I think it's just the importance of of being able to establish amicable working relationships and really um building those connections and that that'll help you kind of longer term as well um and also that it's kind of okay not to have all the answers because as you you progress with your career it's easy to change and if you don't like something then you can change it and you've got the power to really kind of shape where, where you want to go as well so a lot of what kind of unknowns happen like restructures and things like that um, you've still got some um, kind of power yourself to be able to move into to the rules that you want to um, and I think I've probably spoken over my allocated time slot so I'll um, no stop. that's absolutely fine Carolyn it was all valuable information so I wasn't about to cut you off <laughs> um, no that was great thanks very much it sounds like you've got a lot of um, good experience of adapting to change and you know kind of taking opportunities and things like that so much appreciated okay thank you Carolyn um, so I'll move our slide on um, we'll say hello to Megan Hello. Um, I'm just doing my webcam. Stop sharing. There we go. Um, so hello to those of you who don't know me. Some of you 
do know me um, and have seen me in various lectures uh, and workshops over the past few years. Um, so I'm here in two roles. Um, firstly, as Deputy Head of Careers and Employability, um, I lead the team, uh, the Careers and Employability team, who are there to support all students and all graduates from the University of Stirling at whatever stage of their career you're at. So you might be coming up for graduation or you might have just graduated and be thinking, I don't know what they're what I want to do, that's fine, we can have a chat to you. You might be applying for jobs and you want some help preparing for interviews, preparing your CVs, we can absolutely support you with that. Um, so I'm here to plug the career service, um, but I'm also here in the function of, although I graduated in 2006, I did what a lot of people do and I didn't really think about getting a job and went off traveling and I distinctly remember in 2008 sitting, and it's a very privileged position, but sitting in a backpackers hostel in Cambodia with my sister watching Lehman Brothers on the World Service and thinking, how the hell are we going to get jobs now? Um, so, so I did what all good backpackers did and just ignored it for a year and carried on traveling. Um, and I did a lot of temping, hospitality, bar work. I worked on a farm, I worked on a fairground, I worked in construction, pushing wheelbarrows around, you name it, I did it. And then all good things come to an end. In 2009, my visa came up and I returned to the UK and went, okay, so I'm gonna get a grown up job now. And there were very few jobs. Um, so again, temp jobs, temp roles. I took a admin job which paid the grand total of 13 grand a year. Um, and it was a temporary role because it was a maternity cover. And from there, I jumped around a few times and used those, those initial entry admin roles, which weren't graduate level jobs. Um, I My university was probably very disappointed in me for the first few years of my career because I was not doing graduate jobs, um, but working in a number of different admin roles, building up experience in a few different sectors, um, in fact, in a lot of different sectors when I was temping. And then I was able to retrain. So I ended up doing an admin job in a career service, thought this seems quite interesting and did a master's um, with a postgraduate diploma in career guidance. And from there I was able to move into being a careers advisor, which is what's brought me here. So I know exactly what it's like trying to find a graduate job when there's an economic crisis going on. And when Fiona and I first talk, talked about what we could be doing to help the class of 2020, my first thought was, I remember how scary it was in 2008, 2009. And I'm sure other people, not just me, I'm sure other people have got really valuable insights about that experience and what they've learned over the decades since from graduating into that, that experience. In terms of top tips, um, obviously use your career service, that would be my top tip. Um, but as, as all the other speakers have said, so many of my roles have come about through contacts, um, through people that I've worked with briefly, people that I've worked with in other institutions where I've done collaborative projects working with different institutions. I worked in the Midlands for quite a few years. Um, as you might be able to tell from my Midlands accent, um, and working on cross-institutional collaborations meant that I met a whole range of people. But then when jobs came up in their institutions, they'd be like, oh, Megan, have you, have you seen this job? Have you considered applying to this? And so probably about half of my jobs have come about because people have signposted me to them when I've not been looking for jobs, but they've said, oh, did you see this role? And I've gone, oh, sounds good. I'm going to apply for that. Um, so absolutely building relationships, keeping in touch with people, but also not being afraid to take a little bit of a gamble if needs be. I did two or three maternity covers at the start of my career and they were really good ways to get experience. And if you're interested in sectors, um, sectors which are stereotypically maybe female dominated, keep an eye out for maternity covers. They can be a really good way of getting six to 12 months experience in, in a sector. Um, but also at times like this where there are short term roles available, don't be afraid to take them because getting your foot in the door and getting some good experience on your CV, even in a short term role, is really, really helpful. And that was everything from me. So. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate that. And obviously, I'm a little bit biased as well, but yes, kind of supporting everything Megan said there in terms of, you know, the career service is there to help you and support you um, during your time as a student and beyond. So please do come and speak to us if you, you know, if you have any questions or things about your, your plans that you want to discuss with us. OK, great. We will move on to our last speaker for today, who is Ryan. Ryan, are you OK to, to come on now and share your camera? Thanks. Yeah, should be. I think. You're there. We can hear you. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Um, camera should be coming. Uh, yeah, so hello, everyone. This is pretty weird going last, quite a hard act to follow. Um, I would just like to sort of repeat, first of all, what everyone else has already said, to be honest. Um, everything that people, everyone said something that I could relate to um, in one way or another. So I graduated in 2009 um, and I was, I think, pretty naive as to what was going on in the outside world. Um, I was just worried about whether I was going to Fubar on a Thursday or not. And... I thought oh, I'll just get a job. Everyone gets a job after uni and, and that's just what happens. And a bit like someone else was saying earlier on, I was applying for loads of graduate schemes. And unlike them, I didn't actually get anywhere close to getting on one. Um, and then after that, I was applying for just really random jobs, kind of left, right and center without really thinking about what I wanted to do or where these jobs actually were in the UK. Um, and what was actually involved in them. And throughout my time at Sterling, um, which I absolutely loved, I was a student ambassador. And so I worked on like open days and recruitment events um, for the marketing team. And just on one day, my boss at the time, who obviously worked in, in the um, office as her proper adult job, um, just said to me like, all right, and if you want a job, um, Every university has got a marketing department and a marketing team. Why don't you just try and get a little job in one of those, get some experience under your belt, do that for a year, um, and then move on and find something else. And lo and behold, 11 years later, I'm still doing a pretty similar job. Um, so I was like, oh, yeah, Sarah, that's that's fair enough. Um, I'll do that. So straight away. I sort of started Googling different university jobs and applying for those. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely walk straight into a job where the salary is um, 30 grand, 35,000, whatever it might be. That's a perfectly normal starting salary um, for a graduate. And of course it wasn't. Um, so I was very fortunate in the sense that maybe about three or four weeks after graduating, um, I got offered a, a permanent job for a university that I'd never heard of in a city that I'd never been to. Um, and I was like, yeah, OK, I'll go. What's what's the harm? What have I got to lose? And I think it was really like naivety almost that that led me to do that. Even when I look back now, I think what what was I thinking at the time to do that? But I was just so eager, I think, to get that first job. Um and to sort of prove myself and, and prove that I could do it, that I wanted to do it. So off I went, um, packed up all my stuff, moved to Liverpool, started this job, didn't know anyone, didn't know the city, didn't know my way around, anything at all, um, and absolutely loved it. And I was there for four years, um, just over four years, in fact, really randomly, um someone who I was in halls with in first year of uni um, at Sterling also by sheer coincidence happened to have moved to Liverpool at exactly the same time and um, so even though we weren't really friends we we knew each other a little bit and through the power of Facebook we were just like oh let's go to the pub one day um, after work for a quick drink and we've been like really best mates ever ever since he's now moved away um from here but we're still in touch all the time and um, so that was my first four years and then throughout that whole four years really I was like this is good but I really want to move back to Scotland all of my friends are in Scotland or a lot of them were um I wanted to be that sort of eternal student I suppose I think I really when I look at myself when I graduated compared to when I started at Sterling I totally changed in terms of 
um, confidence and self-belief and having that sort of network of people around me, I suppose. And I just thought I want to go back to that. So I applied for loads of jobs, finally got one in Edinburgh, um, moved back up the road to Edinburgh. And within about three months, I was just like, I, I should never have done this. This wasn't the right decision. Um, everything that I thought it was going to be, um, it wasn't both the job, the life, the city, the full work. So within about a year and a half, I was like, okay, I'm going to look for the job, see what opportunities there are elsewhere. And then at that point, I also had a bit of a career change, um, albeit quite a minor one compared to what everyone else has been saying. So I went from working in, in UK recruitment to working in international student recruitment. And my first international job was covering the US. Um, I'd done Camp America for three summers whilst I was at Sterling. So I'd been to the US quite a bit, but I'd never gone there in a sort of recruitment capacity. So I got that job working at University of Manchester, um, moved back down south and ended up spending probably about 10 to 12 weeks a year um, road tripping around America um, with a box of university prospectuses and a banner stand um, always by my side. Really randomly again, um, someone else that I went to Sterling with who was an ambassador with me um, also worked for Sterling Uni covering America. So uh, Amy and I would quite often see each other out on the road, which was really nice. Um, and then finally, I'm in my current job at Lipper, which is which is different again um, in a lot of different ways. So I think for me, just really to summarise, like I say, what everyone else has said, I can relate to in some way, shape or form, definitely. Um, the big thing that I would say is just make make the most of every opportunity that you've got. Make the most of every contact that you have. And I don't mean that in a, in a sort of cheesy way or in a stalkerish way but you just never know who knows who and um, who's going to be able to put you in touch with someone else and um, if it hadn't have been for that fleeting comment that my boss said in the office in Pathfoot building back in 2009 about getting a job I wouldn't be where I was if it hadn't have been for that experience that I had as a student ambassador and that confidence to stand up in lecture theatre A3 on an open day probably with a little bit of a hangover and do a student life talk to a couple of hundred people um, I would never have got the, the jobs that I have had and indeed the one that I've got now and I think like everyone said just take the most of every opportunity you don't have to commit to a job for the rest of your life you don't have to commit to a city or a place um, the world is becoming smaller and smaller and we're, we're seeing that obviously at the moment in the current climate and you've just got to just take the most of every opportunity that you've got I think is a good a good summary that's it <laughs> that's great thank you very much Ryan appreciate that again there's definitely some themes here today around making connections, networking, um, not being afraid to move to a different city for work or to take on temporary roles. So yeah, lots of good information there. Okay, so now we're moving on to really um, look at some questions for our panel then. So if the panel can open your microphones, you don't necessarily need to um, put your webcams back on. But um, we'll just see if there's any particular questions for panel members or anyone in particular, if they're just general questions for everyone. Um, so let's see, questions for the panel. Does anyone have tips on networking and approaching businesses when we know that most businesses will be struggling and or have a freeze on recruiting? So the questions, this is coming through the shared notes. So if you want to ask a question without it necessarily being attributed to your name, then you can we'll just post it in the, the shared notes function there and we'll, we'll pick them up. So I think that's really a question then for, for everyone. Um, does anybody want to, to start with that? Tips on networking when we think businesses might be struggling and have freezes on their recruiting? Megan, you've got um, a hand up. Um, your first name, yeah. Because I was watching these questions coming as we were chatting. Um, I would start with your warm contacts. And 
I think you can see from the panel here today that we were able to go out and ask our alumni, have you got, can you give a couple of hours of your time to help final year students and recent graduates? And people were like, yeah, sure, sounds great. And so use your warm leads. Have a look on the Sterling Network, which um, Fiona's mentioned already, and we'll talk a little bit more about, um, and have a look on LinkedIn. And I would go to alumni as the first point of call because you've got something in common. You can talk to them about what it's like to, you know, walk around the lock on a sunny day. Like, and so they are your warm contacts. So I would definitely be using them because you're not going in completely cold. So. And I think that's that's a good point. You're, when we're talking about networking, we're not necessarily talking about asking for a job. It's more about kind of a, a two way process, how you might be able to benefit each other in the future. Is that fair to say? Would anybody else on the panel like to, to come in on that point? Uh, I was just going to say kind of if it's I can only obviously speak to kind of media and, and, and music industry, which is completely unwildly and there's no rules in many situations um and it is entirely about who you know but an experience i had when i was much younger i just started going to a lot of events so there are a lot of those in the music industry and media industry obviously not right now but you know there's still webinars and stuff and i remember standing in the corner of a room full of people that i wanted to impress or all to my mind had these amazing jobs that i wanted to get and i was sitting in the corner just awkwardly looking at my phone deleting emails that didn't even matter to look important and I think through a friend of a friend I was introduced to a bunch of people and as soon as I started talking to some other people I suddenly realized that they need fresh blood and new ideas and people with energy as much as you need them for maybe a job down the line and it can seem so intimidating especially when anyone says a horrible word of networking which I still don't like but you're just chatting to people and in so many industries depends what that is it's it's you have got an energy and if you're curious people will want to tell you um because having those connections definitely in the industries i work in i you know i'm 32 now and i don't entirely know exactly what's going on in certain music scenes or with certain youtubers or i definitely don't have tiktok so to me chatting to someone who is 21 22 i'm like oh that's what everybody's watching now nobody watches tv so that's got an intrinsic value to me so knowing your own worth and 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 realizing that a contact could gain as much from you as you could from them is is a nice way to approach a conversation brilliant thank you okay we've got quite a lot of questions coming in so we'll try to um get through as many as we can um let's see does anyone have experience with mature graduates and how they should or shouldn't position themselves in the job market um, Megan, that might be a good one for for you as a from a careers advising perspective. I think for mature graduates and for career changes, you've already got a network, and sometimes people kind of forget that or are reluctant to go back to their previous network, um, thinking, well, you know, I left them, I abandoned them, I came back to study, but you've got a network there already to talk to. We talk to a lot of employers um, and big graduate recruiters, but also local SMEs. And they are really, really welcoming of mature students and career changers. What they really want to see is that you can transfer the skills that you've gained from your experience already and that you can take that and bring that into, into a new role. Obviously, I would say come and have a chat to one of us as well if you're not sure about how to kind of articulate that skill set um, but if for example you are currently managing lockdown with small children um, you suddenly become an expert in negotiation and conflict management and jamming doors shut I, I don't have I'm laughing because I can relate really, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so but quite often people understate that and don't want to mention it um, so I think with mature students in particular, really think broadly about the skill set that you've got and the skills that you can bring to an employer and make sure you articulate that in an application. Don't try and brush over the fact that you're a mature student because they'll be able to see from your dates pretty quickly that you finished school in 2004, but you only graduated this year. So they can see and their question is, OK, so what were you doing during that time? Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, 
Anybody else want to come in on that point or we move on to the next question? No? Okay, well, the next one is pretty relevant for everybody, I think. Um, how did you keep your spirits up when you were applying for jobs in a tough market? And I think, Ryan, you said you'd maybe applied for a couple of graduate schemes that you weren't successful at. How, how did you kind of bounce back from that? Um, <laughs> I think I think at the time, again, it was just maybe naivety and I didn't realise that when I was unsuccessful at stage one, that there was probably like 45 other stages to go through at that point. <laughs> um, I think I think what, what I found hardest was once I had that wake-up call and was going to interviews and was constantly being told, like, oh, you were really good, there's nothing that you could do better. There was just someone else on the day who had a bit more experience than you or, or, or came across a bit better. And I think it's just having that... that experience I suppose and that determination to to go into an interview certainly and and kind of own the situation from the start the very first interview that I had I thought it went really well I was literally sat by my phone for the whole of the next day waiting for it to ring and it it didn't ring um and I was I was pretty upset about it at the time and the next day when I found out I was second choice um, the, I asked for some feedback and this, they said the only thing that they could differentiate between me and the person who got the job was the lady who met me in reception and walked me from reception to the interview room felt that I was nervous and that was the only only differentiation so it was even before I'd gone in that interview room I'd I'd screwed it up for myself really and I, I was nervous um, but after that point you just never know who is who's assessing you and, and what they're taking away from that so after that point I always just made small talk with whoever it was I came into contact with be it the receptionist the cleaner the catering staff whatever it was just like hi how are you what's the weather like what's going on and it, it is just a confidence thing yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. I'd agree with that. I've heard um, um, other people saying similar things that it's very common for maybe reception staff or yeah, whoever's greeting you to be asked their opinions by the, the interview panel as well. OK, what about the other members of our panel then? Does anyone else have advice for kind of keeping spirits up when you're applying for jobs? Maybe you've had a few knockbacks. Um, and just the, there's a follow up question to that around who would you rely on or who did you rely on to help keep you sane during this and maybe rounds of job applications, that kind of process. I think I would probably just say is it's hard, but don't take it personally as well, because I think that you just have to think that it's nothing a lot of the time if companies are getting hundreds and hundreds of applications a lot of them don't even really get in front of the the hiring manager's eyes and I don't think it's necessarily a personal thing um I think as well it's just don't try not to give up because the moment that happens you could miss out on opportunities and I remember uh, like years ago I'd actually applied for Sky scanner and got rejected um but years later that's me got a job there now and so I think it's just like keep being persistent as well and not taking it personally um and also just share your like frustrations with other people like everybody's in the same boat and I remember we'd have nights with it with me and my friends just like complaining about not getting anywhere and things like that and I think it's just comforting at a time like this is like that to know that it's not just you that is going through it um but I think as, as Ryan said as well just make sure that if you do actually get to the interview stage and you're not successful to ask for feedback so you can kind of then take it on board for next time or um and same even with like CVs as you start to build that up it's always great to get feedback on your CV to get people's opinions on maybe what you should change and and constantly um yeah try it and do better Great, thank you. Um, anybody else, Ali or Alexandra, would you like to follow up on any point yes, there? I think, I think that I would agree with uh, all the advice. I think it's important to keep in mind that it will be a marathon, not a sprint. It's going to be tough. And we've all been there in slightly different sectors and maybe at different stages in our lives, but it is not easy and obviously the the impact of the epidemic will be playing on everyone's minds so my advice would be also do your bit and 
do not worry too much because you cannot have a control over uh, the uncontrollable. So the only thing you can do is do your bit. As uh, Carolyn said as well, just get together with your friends and family. Use that network to offload the, the worries and you know the emotions that will be accumulating there. But also, I guess, thinking about that idea of marathon approach is also think about what else can you do while you're applying and while you're having this sort of long-term idea of getting to that ideal job or the first job or any job that will give you opportunity. Or what else can you do in the meantime that will actually be still developmental? Because there will be opportunities while you're applying and maybe you might feel you know rejected and that will be natural stage. Um, is there anything else that you could be able to do even for a couple of hours? Um, you might be wanting, okay, develop networks as, as, as we already suggested. That's a great idea, but maybe also keep learning. There will be a lot of organizations, especially the small ones, independent, the arts organizations that are struggling now and they need brain and they need people with talents to help them out. And what a great idea to get yourself involved in that sort of a different maybe understanding of what volunteering could be. It could offer you a very great opportunity to learn and distract you just a little bit from that ongoing, you know, writing application, waiting for emails. So I guess the advice would be try to keep doing something productive, that little bit that also contributes to that hand for ideal job and skills development in, in a way. I think as well, like everything that happens at a different time for different people and it, you've I guess this is maybe at the risk of sounding really old. It's like the benefit of age that that helps you with this is you've just got to accept that some things are just not meant to be and that it all works out in the end. I remember, like I said, I think I was with hindsight really lucky to have got the first job that I did get. And maybe in like the October, November after after we graduated, I remember coming back up to Scotland for the weekend with some friends and pulling up out of the car and putting like two mobile phones down on the kitchen worktop. And then my friends being like, why have you got two phones? And me being like, well, that's my personal one and that's my work mobile. And everybody else was like, oh my God, like I'm working in a bar and you've got a work mobile and you rock up with like a shirt and trousers and like, you know, proper like office attire. And then I think now like those friends are working for like Facebook, Google, they've all got what I would look at and think, oh my God, you've got incredible jobs and an amazing lifestyle. And then I'm, they were comparing themselves against me 11 years ago, but now I'm comparing myself against them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, I think you've got to be so careful to like be just take care of yourself during those periods because like I'm, I'm one of these very, very annoying people that I didn't actually do a job interview until the age of 28. I just sort of got into jobs genuinely by meeting people, doing things, being known for things. Very annoying. But then when I came to my first formal job interview, which was going going to the BBC, and BBC job interviews are like no other. They're competency-based and they're quite intense experiences and you've got to be creative kind of on the spot and stuff. Um, I was lucky that I had all that experience to just talk about. Um, but it, it, was, it was only down to sort of asking for feedback and you know I went for a job a couple of months ago which was way too far above my station and I knew I wasn't going to get it but I was lucky enough to get an interview and as Carol said there I asked for feedback and that got me half an hour over zoom with one of the heads kind of top tiers at the BBC which I would never have got otherwise I definitely didn't get the job but I understood why and at least I had that time to just chat and listen and make a connection so that was really vital. Um, and before, if you manage to get an interview before that, definitely don't be shy to reach out to anyone who you can find, whether that's just finding them on social media and being really respectful and really polite um, and trying to just maybe direct message them and be like, hey, can, can I grab you for a little chat over Zoom, you know, 10 minutes on the phone so that you can get an idea of the culture of that organisation and the strategy, even something as simple as Googling what the managing director has been talking about lately that's the thing that's always really paid off for me because, okay, you might not be going for a job about their strategy, but if you can walk in there and say, oh, well, I read in X, Y, and Z trade, trade press that they're doing this, that will shine off really well on you. So. 
Great, thank you all. Some really good advice there. Um, and following up that question, then the next one we have is about the best piece of advice you were given about finding a job. Um, so we could go in turn with that one. Um, Megan, best piece of advice about finding a job that you've been given? No pressure. It's my job to get advice <laughs> on finding jobs. You're, it's um, just your first lift to write here. That's what it is. <laughs> um, I suppose the best piece of advice that I was given, so and it's slightly backtracking to that previous question about spirits up and keeping you sane. Um, my so I I took a admin job um, and I was applying for grown up jobs and I realised it and it shamefully took me about six months to remember that my previous manager from when I was a student was a careers advisor and and I went to her and went I'm really struggling. Could you help me? And she went, yeah, I'll have a look at your CV and I'll give you, and we practiced interviews. And then all of a sudden my CV, I was getting interviews and my interviews were going a lot better. Um, and like Ryan, I had two or three where I was second choice and the feedback was really useful um, because it was just, it was like, you're doing all the right things, but here's a couple of things that you could just tweak. So in terms of that best piece of advice is probably asking for help. Don't, don't feel you have to do it by yourself. Don't feel that you're in competition with your mates because there will undoubtedly be people who waltz out and do find a graduate job on 35 grand a year. Um, I have friends who did that in 2006 and in 2008 they were made redundant. So they that, that job isn't for life anyway. So for someone who has got an amazing job, they may hate it. Um, so don't compare yourself, but ask for help. Just ask people, ask ask us, ask Alom, ask friends, ask family, let people know. Great, thank you. Um, Alexandra, would, would you add anything to that? And hopefully my dogs are not barking in the background. <laughs> so, um, also, um, something that might be nerve-wracking, but again, an experience. Um, something that I still find nerve-wracking, and I, I did it a couple of times, you know, when you apply for a job, you see this um, uh, different jobs add and sometimes there is a contact to um, to follow up on that and um, I think very very few people um, uh, graduates especially ever think a dream about actually reaching out for a phone and giving that person a, a call and as nerve-wracking it is it's a great opportunity even regardless of what will be the outcome of the whole process is to actually start talking to employers or a person within an organization that's been nominated to actually answer any questions um, to actually get a little bit of an insight of who is that they're looking for um, and what you know that gives you a, a clear indication how can you perhaps craft the uh, the answer or your application because the best advice I guess I, I got and um, Ali also was saying that about following up who you are talking to the boss of an organization, check and do your research and then therefore adapt and adjust your letters of recommendation, your applications to actually fit into that specific market sector or, or an organization. Because if you don't do that, then you sound generic. And I guess having enough guts and confidence to actually reach for that telephone uh, and, and call a person or email saying, could I get just a little bit more information about who are you looking for, uh, might give you that a little bit of an advantage in crafting of, of your applications. And even if it doesn't get you over that hurdle, then for the next time, you also have a little bit more information how to handle the process. Okay, thank you. Um, Ali? Best piece of advice you've been given? Uh, okay, I'm really I'm <laughs> going to cheat and do two really quickly. One was from my dad, who said the world owes you nothing, which was quite quite okay. brutal, quite brutal. To the point, yes. But I, always, I mean, there was some fruitier language in there, but we'll leave that out for just now. But I always kind of stuck that with me, and you know, we're all super lucky to get to go to university and get to go for these opportunities, and it's it's always worth bearing that in mind. Um, just again, I don't know, whatever, stay humble. But my other one is that you are definitely not your job or your career. It can feel like at times when you're searching for jobs or when you're going for jobs. God, I go through like my poor fiance. I'll have like an existential crisis every time I'm thinking about my next step. And like I say, I've essentially been freelance for 12 years. And so that's a lot. 
but separating yourself as a person from the job you know okay that side of your life might not be going so good but that's just one part of your life um and if you get a really good job like you just mentioned that might not last forever so you know don't entirely become that um not to get too therapy on it but it's important okay thanks carolyn Oh, I think I was muted there. Um, I think mine would probably be um, in terms of when you're looking at jobs and the experience that they're asking for, don't be put off if you don't tick all the boxes necessarily in the experience you've got. Um, I think when I was starting to look for jobs, someone told me if you even have maybe 50% of what they're asking for, it's worth a shot applying for it. And I think a lot of the time um, companies just want someone who's willing to learn. So, if there is a few gaps in experience, if you show your willingness that you you can um, learn and, and you're willing to kind of um, get experience, then that's enough. So, and I think that's even with jobs, kind of in my um, like later years as well, I've always applied the same um, approach there, and um, and yeah, it's, it's kind of done me well. Um, and also as well, just on that, just to make sure that you are tailoring applications to that specific um, company and job. So again, I think in the beginning, I just do a generic like copy and paste applying for hundreds of jobs but I think that is obvious people that do that and want to actually take a bit longer to to really make sure that you're um, adapting it for that particular company or role. Great and yourself Ryan? Yeah I mean I would definitely echo what Carolyn's just said there about tailoring applications and series and and making sure that you're doing that properly and if you are copying and pasting things from one document to another just make sure that it's it's still correct. Um, <laughs> the the advice that I got from my dad really was was two little bits. Um, first of all, was do what feels right at the time. And you might look back and think, with hindsight, it was the wrong thing to do. But if it felt right at the time, then you did you did what was right at the time. And the second thing that he says, especially when I'm in a in a bad mood, is that the only thing that's guaranteed in life is that you die. And it, <laughs> It's quite harsh, um, but it's true. And, and the rest of it is what, what you make it. And the more you put in, the more you'll get out. Great, thank you. Some really good points from everybody there. Um, and certainly kind of the same sort of advice we, we would give out to, to students and graduates through the career service as well. Um, the next question is around handling rejections and setbacks. So I feel like we've probably covered that off um, and what we've been talking about before in terms of you know kind of staying motivated and um, taking opportunities as they come along um, hopefully we'll get through as many as we can before the end of the session but if people are happy to for the session to run on a bit then we could um, then we don't need to worry too much about time but if not um, then it might be that we could follow up with some of these questions and um, with our panel later if that's okay maybe have some email correspondence about that. Okay, um, so next one, what key points would you have or cover in either your CV or your covering letter? Um, probably a good one for, for Megan, our Deputy Head of Careers, um, to talk about um, key points for CVs, covering letters. I would echo what Carolyn said, actually. Um, it needs to be tailored and it needs to be specific. And and I remember thinking, oh, I've written once I finally learned how to write a CV. I was like, yay, CV done. Tick. Send that one out. And actually, that's not and that's not the case. And as probably others on the panel now have to do is when I then get applications come in, I can see very quickly who's bothered to read the job description and who's googled us and who's found out a little bit Alexandra mentioned contacting people so I, I recruited a fresh graduate last year who had contacted me in advance and said I've seen your advertising this job I'm not yet qualified for it but I'm really interested in it for these reasons and although she didn't get that job there was then an opportunity that came a few months later and I was like well because she'd applied for it she was already in the system I was like I don't have to go back out for application now and because she'd done that and she'd emailed and said, I know I'm not yet qualified, but and she made that and, and pushed that out. So so but I think the point around what should you cover in your CV or cover letter is whatever the employer is asking you. Make it really obvious that you've read their website, you've read the job description and you're matching their requirements, that you're giving tangible examples. And you will all have examples of teamwork, of leadership, of attention to detail. 
but that you are evidencing what you've got to offer and why you want to apply to that company in that particular role. And you're not just sending out a please hire me. I have I'm a hardworking team player. <laughs> everybody Thank does you. That. Yes, you see that a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Um, I wonder if any of the other members of our panel have, have had experience of being on the hiring side. So in terms of have you ever recruited staff or been involved in the hiring process? And, and what were the, the things that made CVs stand out to you? Anybody to take that one? Uh, I think it was qu quite similar to what Megan had just said there. I've done a few BBC interviews for people that would be working with me. And it's that thing of when someone hasn't really looked at what the specific job is, it's so obvious. You know, obviously you're desperate for a job, you're desperate for, especially in a company like the BBC, everybody looks at it for better or worse. But parents still look at it and go, oh, you've got a job at the BBC. It's like, no, I've done much better things than that. But a lot of people just want in the door. And a lot of people haven't looked at what the actual job is. And that's so that's so obvious. So, you know, just be honest and, and like we've been saying, kind of try and find a way to learn exactly what they're looking for and read that job description. Yeah. So that yeah. idea of put yourself in the position of the employer and understand what they're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Any other thoughts on that or will we go on to the next question? Is that OK? Good. And of course, come and see us in the career service. Happy to give feedback on CVs. Um, okay, do any of you remember uh, feeling ve really daunted with the economic situation to the extent of it freezing you? If so, how did you get over this? So again, I suppose it's that idea of how do you sort of stay motivated and not be too put off by the negative news stories. Did, did anybody can relate to that? Um, I, I ran away back to Australia. Um, Australia didn't have a recession, so I hid ah. out there until my visa ran out and then came back. Um, I wouldn't say that's necessarily the, the best thing to do. Um, and certainly in this time, as Carolyn very well knows, um, travel is not that easy right now. Um, but I do remember thinking, what the hell? I'm thinking, just thinking this is impossible. And I had friends who had graduated a couple of years earlier who had really, really good experience who were stuck in shelves at Tesco and working night shift in warehouses. And there was just a point, and I'm kind of back to that sanity thing of actually almost everyone was doing rubbish jobs, which made it a little bit better. Um, there was always like the one person like Ryan with their two phones. Like my sister had a Blackberry and I was like, you're 21, you don't need a Blackberry. Um, but for the rest of us, it was just that, okay, it's a rubbish situation. and it, it did freeze us, and there was quite a few of us who did that. And I would recommend finding your support and finding your tribe and using that and not thinking, I have to get my dream job right now, because you probably don't know what it is, and that's fine. But just thinking, what can I do that will just nudge me? And if you get an interview, fantastic. You've got an interview. That is a confidence boost in itself. So taking the small wins where you can. Great, thank you. Carolyn, were you going to come in there as well? Yeah, no, I was just going to add that as well. I completely agree. I remember at the time feeling really kind of nervous and, and it was very, very daunting as well, um, just in kind of the future and what's going to happen. And You were constantly kind of reading things that was saying for every uh, job available, there's like 900 plus applicants and things like that, which doesn't help. But I think it's just, I suppose, kind of, trying to focus um I think as Meg said on what you can do and try not to think about what like the worst that can happen because it might not happen and um things like that. And I also think that no matter what happens throughout your career, there is always going to be some obstacles or barriers or challenges that you have to overcome. And maybe it's not going to be as um, as big as like a obviously like a, a recession again, but there's always going to be barriers and things to stop you. Um, so I think you just have to is how you approach it and your positive mindset and then just looking at what can be done uh, within your your kind of constraints that exist externally great thank um, you if for i can that. if i can just add, yeah yeah a, a little moments of meltdown are absolutely okay so don't feel like you have to be a robot and a machine we all been through there so you keep going but it's okay to have a little cry or shout or whatever it is to release all that uh, energy in the room so and yeah 
I think as well, it's important to remember that even though it, it's not an ideal time at the moment, there is a lot of good that will come out of this and a lot of opportunities as well. Like, I don't want to inflate our this panel's like experience or knowledge too much, but <laughs> you know, in, in normal times, we wouldn't be doing this. Um, and that's just one example of how things things change, things adapt, and there will be opportunities that come out of this situation that that wouldn't have been there six months ago. Mm-hmm. We've mentioned it already as well, like the idea of being open to opportunities. Like the position I've got now is exactly what I wanted to do outside of uni, but it took me 10 years and doing a lot of really bizarre jobs that I did not <laughs> expect to do to get here and I, I, I like to hope you can ask my bosses but I'm much better for that because of the experience I've got of, of of going and just saying yes to most things and that that kind of leads us into the the next question which is and a sort of around that theme of when you graduated in a difficult time and you were able to manage that situation do you feel like that now gives you an advantage in a way that you're able to sort of navigate that difficult um, environment when you first graduated and and has it helped you kind of get to where you are now in a way? Yeah, I think it, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say something. Yeah, I think it definitely just gives you that determination that you're like, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep creating opportunities for myself and, Media and music again. It's again all I can speak to, but it's so difficult all the time. It's it's incredibly tough to get into. It's incredibly competitive, and it's and it's there's a lot of things that you can't control. Um. So yes, with a pandemic, it's ten times worse. But there will be, like Ryan said, there will be opportunities come out of that. A lot of the sort of older guard and a lot of companies will take voluntary redundancy, which right now in the BBC, there's a complete hiring freeze on. And even internally, they're desperate for people to leave. That will, if you can see through that part, that will then open the gates up to a lot more lower level roles, which cost the company less. Um, The models of that are a whole different story, but that will allow you to get a foot in the door once this stage has got over. So a bit of kind of hope for the future is always useful. Okay, great. Yeah, and I think, like you say, it's sort of developing that resilience, really, in a way to to keep going, even when you're you're faced with a difficult situation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, our next question is someone who's applying for jobs, um, but employers are coming back and saying that they don't have enough experience. How do I get around this? That's probably a common frustration. Uh, Ryan, would you like to come in on that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would just say, like, I totally sympathise with you because I got that, like, every single time that I was going for a job. And I think it's don't underestimate the experience that you already have and don't undersell that experience because everything that you'll have done at, at uni or outside of uni, whether you're um, in a club or society and you're like the treasurer or the captain or whatever or you're on the radio like Ali or you're a student ambassador like I was or whatever it might be you will have so many skills and so much experience from all of those things and it's quite often just about joining the dots between what you've got and what they're looking for and I remember back in the day in my first job, I used to do like mock interviews with kids in high school. And I would always say to them, no matter what experience you've got and no matter what job you're going for, you will find a link between it if you look if you look hard enough. Um, and the best example I've got is a kid who wanted to be a, like a fitness coach or something. And he worked in McDonald's and he was like, tell me how that is a link. And I was like, well, by working in McDonald's, you know what not to eat. <laughs> and, and it, you know, I was clutching at straws a little bit, but there's always, always a link. So don't let it knock you back. And it, it is a spiral as well. Like the more experience you get, the easier it becomes to get more experience again. Great, thank you. Anybody else, Carol? Were you going to say something yeah, on that point? Yeah, something similar. Just 
Um, I remember when I was having a, an interview for the, the graduate scheme that I ended up getting the job on um, and I was asked to describe a time when and I kind of sat there for a couple of minutes and I thought in my head I don't think I have experience of this example um, so in the end what I did was kind of relate it vaguely back to I think it was like a dance group that had been at a uni and it, that was at uni at the time um, and it wasn't completely answering the question but I remember afterwards a year or two later and I was speaking to the the man that had interviewed me and he'd said that he actually quite liked the fact I was kind of open and honest and said well I don't maybe have a specific example that completely answers the question but I suppose this is similar and this is how I reacted to it and he said that he appreciated a, the, the honesty but also that I did link it to something else that in my head connected the experience or I, I could kind of admit that my approach to it would be similar so I think it's actually it's not kind of underselling yourself and you will have the, the skill it's just maybe not in the exact kind of manner that it's been asked for. That's a very good point. Yeah, kind of emphasising those transferable skills to an employer is a, is a really key thing, if you, especially if you don't have a lot of experience around the type of job that you're trying to go into. Um, Ali and Alexandra, would you like to say anything about that in terms of how you deal with um, applications if you're being rejected on the basis of a lack of experience? Yeah, it's it's a tricky one. It's definitely a tricky one. Um, but uh, one one side definitely is an articulation, and how can you actually uh, join those dots of your experience and and translate it into the context to show that that um, you indeed have skills. But I guess again, um, I, I'm always focused on learning and on opportunities. So again, I said that already, but I would emphasize that idea of. Um, developing still even while you're looking for jobs and offering your uh, yourself and your uh, brain and your skills and your willingness to other organizations perhaps there is someone local or doesn't have to be as we're proving that we can be actually quite geographically dispersed and be doing that but there is a lot of organization and a lot of students uh, who join us today to alumni um, will be uh, from media from uh, from management so perhaps there are arts organization, third sector organization, your local council, maybe you can connect and say, you know, this is specifically, I'm sure that by now everyone uh, can do a quick SWOT analysis. Perhaps there is an area you would like to be working on. You know, it might be networking. You've mentioned at the beginning, some of you, how to do it. It's a nerve wracking ability, but might be something that you really feel like, you know, now when I'm going through this process, I can be a little bit productive and maybe there is, um, some data handling, or maybe there is something that I can actually learn and help other organizations. Uh, you might be actually wanting to even, I don't know, help organization to put uh, a lot of nonprofit organizations will be now desperately putting applications for funding. That's a great opportunity for you to be able to help them from anywhere. You don't have to be at the premises. That would be actually quite impossible right now, but you can be still doing those little bits. And I guess then, um, you will be able to uh, use that opportunity and that experience and highlight that in your um, uh, recruitment process, because I don't think that that briefly, you know, just claiming on I am an alumni who unfortunately graduated in difficult times is enough of the phrase to be using. You have to then sort of, um, um, as, as we already said, develop the resilience and actually show what you've actually done constructively with this time. Just sitting and crying, and although it's okay, we acknowledge that it's okay, five minutes cry every so often. The next step is how can, be, how can you be creative? Keeping one eye on those opportunities, perhaps careers that you want uh, to have, but if you don't, then that's a great opportunity for you to be creative. Is it something else that you might be doing? Um, is it something else, an, an, an additional area of expertise that you might be, or interest? You might be really fascinated with all the digital stuff and maybe animation or whatever that is. That's a great opportunity for you to be developing those skills, even in your back room and your bedroom or kitchen or wherever that is. So don't forget uh, to keep um, an eye on the skills that you can still develop. Okay. I just want to pause at this point just to make sure the panel are all still okay. Are you all right to carry on for another oh, good, yeah. 10 minutes or so? Yeah, yeah, I know, because I think it's just it's great if we could um, get through some more of these questions, because it's brilliant to have so many questions um, from our participants today. Okay, so we'll keep going just now. Um, 
The next one we have then, I think I'm going to direct to Megan <laughs> because it's around um, if you don't know what you want to do in your career, what would you advise someone to do to help them clarify what might be a best fit for them in the future? Um, so I would say talk to your career service. <laughs> um, talk to your careers advisor and throw some ideas around. I've just put a link. So I've just put a link actually in the chat to the career support for graduate Canvas page, which is a open access one. So you don't need to log into Canvas. So if you graduate and you've lost your access, you can still get the information. And the reason I put it in for the last chat was there's quite a lot of links to online courses. So so I know, for example, I was talking to a graduate um, recently who has done a CIPD course um, online while she's in lockdown because she's got nothing to do. So she's done a professional qualification off her own back. Um, and there's lots of those online courses. So I put a link in that's got lots of links to coding and and Excel. Oh, my God, if you can use Excel well, then I will happily hire you. Um, but if you have no idea what you want to do, I would start to explore ideas. There's various links on there. Um, talk to people, talk to friends, family. Be curious. Find out what other people do. Find out how they got into that job. There's so many things. And, and obviously, as a careers advisor, that's kind of why I ended up doing this job, because it's fascinating talking to different people, listening to the panel today, all talk about how they got into their different careers, how they found out about jobs. One thing which I often, and some of you may have heard me say this in lectures, is if you ask a room of five-year-olds what they want to be in a, when they grow up, nobody's going to say they want to work in recruitment or they want to work in marketing or they want to be a lecturer because they don't know those jobs exist. And so many of us are working in roles that we didn't know exist or possibly didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. So be curious, talk to people, listen, you know, use resources that we've got use resources within your own networks talk to friends and family and just find out about different jobs that are out there don't worry if you don't know what you want to do try different things and if you don't like it move on to the next thing so it's that trying different things talking to people and just being curious and exploring your options and talking to the career service of course <laughs> thank you very much megan um yeah, does that does that sound familiar to anyone else on the panel? Do you, when you were at uni, did you feel a bit lost as to what you wanted to do next? I still have no idea what I want to do next. <laughs> that's why I've done so many different things, and I think that's always good to bear in mind as well. When you're going into it, people are always moving about and 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 changing course. And I I think for a while I was quite nervous because, like I said, I've not done formal interviews, and I was going in to go and try and become a producer at the BBC, which is what I'd aimed at. And there are a lot of stages generally people go through. You apprentice trainee schemes, then there's a researcher, then there's an assistant producer, then the producer. That's the kind of traditional way. And I just knocked that all out of the water, but I'd done the same things, but just in a free, slightly wild way as a self-employed person and have my own company. Um, but yeah, it's it, it, it's daunting and just accepting that that thing is daunting and again, looking for those opportunities and going, well, this might not be exactly what I want to do, but if it's a decent job and I can enjoy it right now, I think the other guys were saying that, yeah, don't, you know, don't worry about taking a job that's maybe not exactly what you want to do or the dream job right now, because it takes a while to get to get there. And often the dream job might not be what you thought it was going to be. And the thing you didn't want to do turns into the dream job because that's where you flourish. Um, yeah. Okay, great. And other other our other panel members. Um, yeah, is there anything else you would add to that then about what you could do to help you clarify what's the best fit for you? Um, I think as someone kind of said earlier as well, is if you aren't sure as well, then just kind of think about your skill set and what skills you've got that would be transferable and to what roles and things like that. And and even if you do have to take a job at the moment, then maybe just try and, and get one that you can transfer skills longer term. So um, I think, though, speaking to people and understanding like, yeah, what jobs are out there and and just obviously like reading through different like job descriptions and things like that um helps too. But I think that yeah, as Ali said too, I think it, I kind of just 
I suppose like fell in in a way to like kind of digital marketing without properly realizing this was going to be my career as well so sometimes I think that the, the jobs you do end up having you don't set out and plan them so I think that it is okay not to know and you can get 10 years down the line and still not properly know as well so um yeah I think it's just more understanding like what you even enjoy and thinking about your kind of more personal life like your hobbies and interests and is there anything that you could apply from that over into your your career yeah and maybe some spent spending some time just reflecting on that you know what have you enjoyed about previous roles that you've done what have been the best parts of it what have been the bits you didn't like as much um, and hopefully that all informs your decisions going forward I think okay. as well yeah. like, the, the more that you progress and the more that you earn the harder it is in some ways to make those decisions and to think actually I'm going to take a gamble and now you've got like the ideal opportunity to do that you don't really have uh, without sounding harsh you don't have a lot to lose you've got a whole world out there and grab as much of it as you can whereas 10 years down the line if you've got a decent salary or you're married or you've got kids and a car and a mortgage and you've got all these commitments and things that tie you down um like 10 years ago all I wanted was a good job and a house and then when I got that I was a bit like oh okay like what do I do now? And and now I'm a bit like, I've had all those things and I wish I'd done a different path. So don't look at someone else and think that what they've got or what they've had is is perfect because it's it's not always. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good advice. Yeah. So I was just going to add, even if you kind of, it's hard to identify, I suppose, what your strengths are or what your skills are in yourself. But even ask like, friends and family where they think your strengths are too, because sometimes they can um, bring up something that you didn't necessarily realise was maybe a strength, and that can help maybe shape like um, uh, yeah your career or the rules that you might want to go into based on other people's perceptions of your kind of characteristics and skill set. Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, um, next question then is directed um, to Ali specifically. So a mature graduate looking to get work in media and marketing, um, would you recommend using my life experience rather than young energy in networking? Oh, energy is nothing to do with age, <laughs> I would argue. Um, I think it would depend specifically what area you were wanting to get into. But if it's if, if you've got a marketing degree, I was actually just thinking this. Excuse my wonderful cat to my right shoulder, that's <laughs> Kelly Kapowski, just hanging out, um, she's just woken up. Um, yeah, no, what was I talking about? Yeah, if um, it depends on, on, on the thing you're wanting to go into, but m marketing is key to so, I mean, every industry, what industry is it not useful to? And I was just thinking the other day, um, so I manage this guy transatlantically who lives in Nashville, who, you know, I meet a couple of times a year and I, I speak to him every single day, FaceTime calls, the remote working thing was nothing out of the ordinary but lately because I've got a full-time job on top of that I've been looking for another manager to work with him and I know a lot of different managers around the world and more and more I'm looking at the gaps of what I have missing and I'm like I need someone that really knows about marketing to deal with that and I'd much rather have someone that knows nothing about music but really knows about marketing a product because at the end of the day that's what I've got and I think a lot of people are put off from the music industry or media because like oh well I don't know about this or I don't know about that but there are thousands of jobs in every you know Glastonbury Festival for example has huge marketing teams and all all manner of different jobs that don't necessarily require a knowledge of um, music or media but anyway I've gone on a bit of a tangent um, I think the wonderful thing about music and media compared to when I graduated is the accessibility to start things up and just do it yourself. Um, the hardest part is funding, of course. It's always going to be hard. Um, but the access to equipment like this very fancy show-offy microphone I've got was not that expensive. And that gives incredible quality. And the things you could go and do with that would be remarkable, even in comparison to 10 years ago. Um, to the point of over the last couple of years, I've worked on quite a lot of projects uh, for both BBC Three or for BBC Radio One, both visually and audio, when I've been working with uh, new content creators, I was careful not to say young content creators there, but new talent, people who haven't worked with the BBC before. Um, and we have worked in partnership and gone out and found these people who are making films just on YouTube or making podcasts elsewhere. I've gone and found them and said, would you like to make something with us? And it's quite a, a unique project within the BBC. And then we've worked together to create that project and we've put it out. Everybody's been paid fairly. And 
a lot of times when we have conversations with people, usually more on the younger end of the scale, they're just like, well, why would they do it with BBC? Why would they give up that control? Why would they give up that? Because they've got a goal of being a famous YouTuber who earns a crazy amount more than the BBC could ever dream of paying them. Um, so there's, again, it's that kind of looking at are the sort of traditional institutions exactly where I want to be just because they seem like a safe bet? Or is there a more entrepreneurial thing I could, I could aim at if you have a real niche or knowledge of, I don't know, samba drumming there's probably a big market from that in the world somewhere which you can reach which there will not be a traditional full-time job for i don't know if that's exactly what you were asking but i'm more than happy to chat on email afterwards or or, or whatever and the cat thanks has very much for that again. appreciate it um okay i think there was just one last question um before we we wrap up the session today and this one was over in the public chat so let me go back to that one um, and it's a question for all members of the panel. Do you have or have you had a mentor and can they help in job searching? So we'll maybe go from right to left this time. We'll start with Ryan. Um, have you ever had a mentor or do you currently have a mentor? Um, so I did like a couple of years after I graduated, I did the Chad Institute of Marketing qualification um, and I had a, a mentor through that and to be honest i didn't i didn't get an awful lot out of it um i would say that the best mentors are people that i've just met along the way who i've looked up to and built up a relationship with um either like previous bosses or people that i've worked with and now if i'm applying for a job or if i've got questions or concerns about work or whatever it might be I would, without hesitation, pick up the phone and speak to any any one of those. And it goes back to what I said right at the start, like make the most of those contacts, keep in touch with people, whoever it might be, um, because you never know, especially if, if you go into like a small industry um, or a small sector, like you never know from one day to the next who could be your boss, who you could be working with, who could be your competitor. And it, it's best to keep all those people pretty close to you if you, if you can. Okay, thank you for that. Carolyn, have you had the benefit of a mentor before? Yeah, so um, in my first role um, for a couple of years, I actually had one. Um, but similar to what Ryan said, I was kind of just provided with somebody. It wasn't like a kind of organic um, connection that we already had. Um, and I, I thought found some benefit of it just because he knew the company so well um but to be honest I didn't really get a lot from it but I think looking back that was probably because I didn't fully appreciate the benefits of a mentor what I actually wanted to get out of that relationship and I think I just assumed that he would come and give me kind of guidance on what I should do but I didn't really use them for that probably um so later on I've had other mentors who again I've kind of met through networking and connected with um, and I found that a lot more beneficial and um, so I think that they are great to have but I think it's just been clear of what you actually want out of that relationship um, and you kind of guiding it to rather than just expecting them to give you all the answers and um, that you don't know you need kind of things so um, but yeah I'm a massive kind of advocate of it and I think it can be very very beneficial. Great thanks and uh, Ali yourself? Uh, yeah, probably similar to Ryan. I've had a lot of like unofficial mentors, I suppose, people I've just connected with and found ways to connect with on not just like, oh, that one dimensional, I can get something from you. Like you were saying, Carolyn, way it's been more like, again, like how can I help out or how can I, you know, how can I inform you? And actually the BBC's got a scheme which I kind of fall between the gaps of right now, which is for pairing up senior managers with really entry level people and it's it's kind of a both way mentorship role because the further obviously you get up the chain of a company something as big as the bbc you do definitely lose touch of who you're meant to be serving the audience and, and that will be the same in so many under, other industries and i know a few people that have got on it as a junior member of staff but also senior members of staff who are loving doing it and it goes kind of both ways um i've recently signed up to a thing called creative access 
which is a brilliant scheme run by various different organisations, I think ITV and the Financial Times. And that is specifically to help um, people from a diverse background gain a mentor. And it's, I've got so much from it. I've done like three calls with a girl in London who's just trying, trying, trying and trying desperately to get into the BBC. And it's been nothing other than kind of sitting and listening to where she wants to go and listening to what she's prepped for an interview and maybe just giving her a little steer. She actually emailed me just to just during this saying can I jump on zoom with you because I've got an interview tomorrow I'm like that's cool but I can get a lot from that just by chatting to her and learning from her so yeah it doesn't need to be an official thing but there are loads of industry groups and if it's a specific industry I think most industries will have trade bodies that you can find out that I'm sure the career service can point you in the direction of. Brilliant thank you and yourself Alexandra have you had a mentor previously or at the moment? I am very lucky and I do have a, a mentor um, at the moment and um, someone very experienced and it's uh, it's it's absolutely a great um, relationship and an and opportunity to have someone like that to bounce your idea with and you know listen to about um, uh, those difficulties in, in any stage in the career but um, uh, I didn't have mentor in my sort of previous sort of um, as Megan was saying temp job or temporary jobs and perhaps my understanding of mentor and mentorship uh, has changed. I've been maybe lucky and lucky enough that I've spent many years in formal education and doing um, research and, and then a PhD as well. So I guess I was always used to that idea of having a supervisor or someone who will be actually uh, that critical platform for bouncing of ideas. And I think that I took from those experiences, I've, I've took the idea that it doesn't always have to be the very formal structure because obviously you will have a greater chances to have a mentor if you're working in a, a bigger institution or bigger organization or formal setting. But I think it's a, it's a great, as, as a panelist said as well, um, it's who you know and those little connections that you're making along the way. Um, and so I very often um, obviously use my mentor quite a lot, but also use what I call my critical friends. So people who I meet on the way and I do a lot of um, uh, teaching um, uh, across you know different fields and I do a lot of research with different um, institutions and I meet people on the way and very often is about um, asking a simple question. So it doesn't always have to be the live stream. It might be that and one person knows exactly what you need. So knowing that those critical friends will be there and you might be uh, having a little network of, it might be a critical friend who is in the very similar uh, sector or the sector you're aspiring to. It might be someone, uh, your peer, your alumni who, who is graduating right with you that also forms part of your critical uh, friends network. It might be someone who works, um, as Carol was saying, um, in a very different um, um, sectorial um, uh, area arrangements, but maybe is that very specific role that you're interested in um, being marketing or being producer. So yes, having those mentors that um, uh, that give you the big advices, but also the critical friends that can just tap in uh, and help you answering specific questions is something that um, I would recommend. Um, and I'm sure that you will find your way of creating those crit critical friends uh, on the way. Brilliant. Thank you, Alexandra. I love the idea of a critical friend. That's great. <laughs> um, and finally, yourself, Megan. Um, very similar to everyone else, actually. Um, so I'm a massive advocate of mentoring for mentors and for mentees. And I think when it's done well, it can be fantastic. But as Ryan and Carolyn both mentioned, there's lots of jobs where you get given a mentor and you're never really told what to do with the mentor. And the mentor's never really told what to do with the mentee. And the full advantage of the situation isn't really taken. And often you end up seeking out your own mentors. Um, so I've never had a formal mentor, but I've had lots of people throughout my career who I've stayed in touch with, um, probably uniquely. Um, all of my previous managers have been careers advisors which has meant that they are very much they're happy <laughs> they're happy when you say I'm thinking of leaving um, and they go yay that's brilliant and they kind of coach you for interviews which I think is unique to them um, but it means that I've got that network of advocates for me and I've got a network of people that I can go back to and bounce ideas off um, across different institutions like Ryan said certain fields and sectors are really small I, I work in higher education everybody knows everybody um and i i hazard a guess that 
I know people in almost every institution in the country just because we have a really strong professional body as well and everyone just moves around and works at one place and then works at another place so keeping in touch with people and using them certainly as informal mentors if they're not formal mentors but if you do have an opportunity to get a formal mentor spend the time at the start of that mentoring relationship really brokering what you are trying to get out of the relationship and what they want to get out of it because it is really useful and then on the flip side I now get people coming to me saying oh, I'm looking for a kind of mentor and I'm like why don't you go and ask a grown-up don't ask me <laughs> so. great Thank you for that. Um, I think we've managed to get through all the questions now. Um, just a massive thanks to all of our panellists. I really appreciate um, the time that you've taken to come and join us today, and especially with us obviously running over our original planned time. Um, but this was obviously the first time that we've tried this format, so that gives us lots of ideas for moving forward. And it's just to say it was great to get so many questions from our participants there as well so I'm pleased we managed to, to get through all of them um, yeah so just to say a very big thank you to you all for, for being here and a thank you to all of our participants for joining in and for submitting their questions today as well um, let me just check I think um, Jane is still with us she was having a few problems with her sound so I just wanted to see if um, do you want you to come in at the end there, Jen? Are you are you there? No, she's lost her microphone again. <laughs> um, so Jen and Fiona have said, um, just kind of uh, reiterating my comments there, just a big thank you to you. Um, and I'm sure if it's OK with, with you, maybe some of our participants might want to possibly connect through LinkedIn or something like that. Um, if there's um, a potential to, to carry on some of these conversations and obviously we'll have the, the recording for, for other students as well in the future. Um, and great, and some just some really nice positive comments from from people coming through. Um, so as I say, I, I think all of our, there's an, a question about email addresses there, but as I say, I think all of our panel panelists are on LinkedIn. So if you do want to connect with them or perhaps speak to um, myself or Jen, and we'll see if we can, can put you in touch. Um, okay, I'll just, there's a couple of last comments coming in. So I'll just pause for a moment to let people type them. Yeah, just more thank yous. So there you go. <laughs> really extra thank yous for, for all our panelists. So um yeah, so if that's uh that's really us for today. So um you can now feel free to to close the browser. And again, thank you for joining us. Really hope that you found it beneficial. Okay, bye for now. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Good luck everyone.